So we are starting this um, series in the prison epistles. Uh, they're called prison epistles because Paul wrote them from prison. There you go. So I think I sent out a text to a couple of preacher friends this week, and uh, only one of them responded back, um, and his response was, that's deep. But when we look at the scriptures, <clears throat> there are extremes, and then there's the middle path, and and um, I think this is going to come to bear on on what I'm going to preach through the next few weeks. But um, you know the guy the guy who calls himself a Calvinist, he never refers to the scriptures, or very seldom refers to the scriptures that lead one to believe in the free will of man to accept or reject Christ. And the guy who calls himself Charles an Arminian, so he believes that the, my chief grief with the Arminian position is that they believe you can lose your salvation, okay? But the idea of the free will to accept or reject Christ is found there in the Arminian position. Well, that guy, he never or very seldom refers to the scriptures that lead us to believe in the sovereignty of God, in eternal salvation and things of that nature. You'll find those two extremes on anything. Brother Michael, um, I had a fellow tell me once when, when I'm in the middle, in case y'all haven't figured that out by now, uh, I believe that man has the the ability to accept or reject Christ, and yet I believe in eternal salvation. Uh, and then there are various other parts of those two extremes that, that we accept because we find them in Scripture. And I had a guy tell me one time, uh, Brother Michael, that the only thing in the middle of the road was either yellow, as in the stripe, that we don't have on this road out here, amen, but most roads have it, or dead, which is, you know, a possum, coon, whatever that's been run over. Uh, but you'll find in Scripture that it, it there's a phrase either, it, and it's, it's written one of two ways, either turn not to the left, turn not to the right, so that's avoid your extremes. Uh, the other way it's written is when you turn to the left, when you turn to the right, listen to the voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. So whatever our positions are, they have to be rooted in the Scripture. And when we, when we, we are not what I would call hyper-Calvinists, though if you take the middle position in Scripture, you're going to... You're going to accept some points of Calvinism and some points of Arminianism. And I want you to know as we go forward that we're going to be intellectually and most important, scripturally honest. We're going to read those texts that most people avoid because they're found in here. And the Bible says that all of Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means, Kendra, that God breathed that scripture and he put it there for a reason. Uh, and we need to accept it. We need to touch some of it. I, I said in the text that it's deep water. In other words, it is, it's definitely not the milk of the scripture when we hit some of these texts that we're going to go through in the next few weeks. But Randy, they're there for our nurture and our admonition. Now, as, as babies, what do we mostly consume? Milk, that's right. But then Peter said that you should be eating meat, but you're still eating milk. So we're, we're going to chew on some meat in the next few weeks, um, and we're going to treat it exactly as the Scripture should be treated, which is what's the best commentary on Scripture? Come on now, y'all can talk to me. What's the best commentary on Scripture? scripture okay isaiah said here a little there a little line upon line precept upon precept so when we come across some of these hard texts we're going to compare scripture with scripture to see exactly where we should stand on those hard texts but this morning uh the title of the sermon is a sermon from a salutation a salutation is a greeting and just the greeting here in uh in Ephesians chapter 1, I, I feel like there's a complete sermon in it. The Lord worked in my heart about it. And so let's read Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to read just two verses of Scripture this morning, verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, Paul, 
an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray once again. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you again for your word, Lord. I thank you that your word is profitable to teach us how to be saved, to teach us what's right, to teach us what's wrong, to teach us how to make wrong things right and how to keep right things right this morning. Lord, and not just this morning, but it, it teaches us that every time we go to it. And I pray again, asking you to use me to speak to the hearts of your people. Lord, you've already worked in my heart on this text, and I pray that you would take this text and work in the hearts of your people. And again, I pray, Lord, if there's one here that's lost, that today they would be saved. But for those of us who are saved, Lord, help us not to just put it on mute and go, oh, that's not for us, but help us to, to chew on it, Lord, and to, and to get nourishment from it, Lord, and to try to grow and be more like you. Lord, prune us and purge us that we might bloom and bear fruit. For we know all that comes from the root of Christ Jesus. And it's in his name that we ask it all. Amen. The first word there, Paul, is just a nickname, right? But in that nickname is a transformation. What did Paul's mama name him? Saul, that's exactly right, Nathan. His mama named him Saul. So what does the scripture say if a man be saved? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that therefore if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature and old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And in Paul, in this nickname, it may just be a simple name, but there's a, there is contained therein the greatest of changes. He was born Saul. He was educated Saul. He was a rich and respected Pharisee named Saul. But when he met Christ, things changed. Uh, <clears throat> he may have seen Christ before. Somebody asked me just recently if, uh, if it was possible that Paul had seen Christ. And uh, they had come across it in a Sunday school lesson somewhere. Well, the stoning of Stephen was in months of, within months of Christ's ascension, right? So if he held the coach for people at Stephen's stoning, it is very possible that he was there not only at the crucifixion chanting, but in those bogus uh, trials where, he was con where Christ was convicted. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he says of himself. So it's very likely that he was not just there, but he's one of the ones that said, guilty, condemn him, crucify him. But when Paul came to know him, you know, a lot of people want to say that Paul got saved on the road to Damascus. Maybe he did, Miss Karen. I don't know exactly where he got saved. This is what I know, that the Saul that everybody knew before Damascus was definitely changed when he left Damascus. Somewhere, whether it be on the road to Damascus or whether it be, as I believe, when, when God sent Ananias over there to preach into him, Either way, I think he was convicted on the road and converted when Ananias came on the scene. But whether he was convicted and converted on the road, it doesn't matter. We know this, there was a change in Paul's life. And Paul knew from the moment that he got saved that he was going to be preaching the gospel. In fact, he was found preaching the gospel immediately thereof. We, we get this idea today that we want to get saved today and, and Channing was talking about somebody earlier that said they've been in church their whole life because their mother was in church when they were conceived and so when he was still in the womb he was in church and he was in church like myself from about five days of age so he's been in church his whole life. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're growing. You can sit in the church and, and be cold and dead and as far away from Christ I've seen preacher's wives get saved. Preacher's hot. I'm taking this off. But, uh, in fact, I know Charles and I know an evangelist who, who was preaching 25 years when his wife got saved one week in, in his own meeting that he was preaching. Um, he's a, a crippled man we know from Middle Tennessee that preaches around here sometime. I, I met a, a missionary, and when, when we heard, his, heard the wife's testimony, Denise and I went, boy, something ain't right. There was nothing in that testimony, Kendra, that said, I realized I was lost. I called on Christ. It was all about what they had done and nothing about 
What did Paul say on the road to Damascus? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord is admitting his supreme authority and admitting that you need to be submitted to him. There was nothing in that. And then we were in a conference with them a few months later. Same testimony. And then Charles, we were in a conference with them about three, four, maybe six months after that. And when the wife got up to give, to give her testimony, she looked at Denise and myself and said, this is going to be different than you heard the last two times. And she talked about being in a meeting and realizing that she had been in church her whole life but had never truly been saved, and she called on God. In other words, she understood that God loved her. She'd always understood that. She understood that she was a sinner. She'd always understood that. She understood that sin had a salary. She'd always understood that. She understood that Christ paid the price. But she finally came to grasp that she had to believe that in her heart and confess Christ Jesus with her mouth. And when that happened, boom! She's a new creature. That transformation that we see there in Paul's life. It needs to be seen in every life. The second thing I want you to see, it comes for the next little phrase there. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I'll, I'll take both of my next two points from that phrase, an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle was uh, <clears throat> set apart. Okay, An apostle was not just a disciple. Sometimes we confuse because you have the, the 11 and then Paul is one born out of due season, the 12th apostle. Uh, then we get confused, the disciples and the apostles. But the apostle was somebody who spent three years with Christ. The apostle, uh, <clears throat> let's read a couple. Flip back a, a book. Flip back to Galatians chapter 1. And we'll read just couple of verses there, maybe four verses here in Galatians chapter 1 to explain to you uh, about Paul the Apostle and exactly what this means. And if I figure out what I do with my glasses, I'll have a much easier time reading it. Amen. Um, there they are. Verse 15, it says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. So what is Paul talking about? He went into the desert for three years. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You might remember that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where the gospel is defined for us. The gospel is defined for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The gospel is Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and was seen. But by whom all was he seen? Let's read. Let's start in verse number 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that... He was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen of James, then all of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called. In other words, I'm, I'm not, I don't have proof to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was within me. Paul was sanctified. He was set apart uh, to God. He was set apart. He spent this three years in the desert, and most people believe that Christ was actually there with him but whether it was there in body or there as he is with us today in spirit i know not but this much is that paul this much i know is that paul was not only transformed but he was commissioned he was set apart okay excuse me he was sanctified he was set apart we sanctify everything and and i try to go through this time and again and to me it's somewhat comical and 
You might even find it somewhat gross, but just the things that we sanctif sanctify. We sanctify certain water for the toilet, right? We don't go, I mean, you know, typically, and it's probably true at your house too, that water in the toilet is it's clear, right? You can see everything in the toilet. But I don't go in there and dip my cup in that toilet water and take a drink, do I? We sanctify that water to take sewage away from the house. We don't use that water. We don't go dip the measuring cup in there when Denise is making some bread to get water from there. That water is sanctified to its own use. We have water in the kitchen that is sanctified for cooking. Now, I know Gaines Trace has won an award for the best water in the state of Mississippi, and bless them, I'm thinking I still like mine coming through that that filter in the refrigerator. I think it tastes better than coming straight out of the spigot. Spigot. So we, we use the water in there. It's sanctified. We use that for drinking. We use that for cooking. We sanctify bowls. You know, our dog's got a bowl. Your dog, you have a, I don't know, you don't, I don't know if you have dogs, but I know you got a sight of cats over there. Uh, you, you know, you don't go eat out of those same bowls that the cats eat. If you do, please don't tell me. Amen. I mean, we set apart bowls to, to use for ourselves and to use for our animals. We've even got a, a big old huge bowl set apart in the pasture for the sheep to eat from. I don't go eat out of that bowl. Even if I did want that much salad or something, I'm not going to eat out of that bowl because that our lives are set apart not for our own use but for the master's use. The Bible teaches that there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It talks about that some vessels are wood and some vessels are silver and some vessels are gold, but they're all set apart for the master's use, okay? So he has salvation, and then we see the sanctification where he's set apart. And finally, that same word, the word apostle means a sent one. So he's not only transformed, there was a transformation, there's a sanctification, and there is a commission. Paul's commission was to reach the Gentiles. If we were to take the time to go to Acts chapter 9, when God convicted him, he knew he was going to preach. Kendra, I didn't get right with God until Tuesday before Thanksgiving, 1995, but I knew for years before that that if God didn't kill me, I was going to preach one day. I just knew it. I can't tell how I knew it. The first time I heard it, Charles, my dad had led this old retired army guy to the Lord. And he, we were over at his house visiting. I'd ride around with my dad when he was calling on people. And, and uh, the guy said, John, you know, you got favor with people. People like you. you you're going to preach the gospel one day. And I thought to myself, you old drunk, you ain't been saved six months. I'm not going to be a preacher. You know, but here I am today. That's the first time I remember the Lord working in my life and any kind of mention of me being behind the pulpit. And then here I am. Uh, I remember just... I don't necessarily believe in dreams and visions and all that kind of stuff. And yet, just daydreaming, it seemed like I would come to myself when I was on the car lot in my early 20s. And I would, I would just kind of like be daydreaming and see myself preaching and go, No, that's not, not me. I'm not going to do that. Paul was sent apart. He knew from the beginning that he was going to preach to the dogs. Listen. The Bible says that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Bible says in Titus 2 that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The Bible says basically over and over that, what did Christ say? If I be lifted up, I'll draw how many men? Come on, how many was he going to draw? If I be lifted up, I'll draw how many? I'll draw all men. If I be lifted up, if the Son of Man be lifted up, he'll draw all men. Everybody receives a call to salvation. If you accept the call to salvation, you're going to get a call to service, Randy. The question is, what is your call to service? Everybody gets one. Look with me in, uh, in Romans chapter 12. We'll go back to Romans chapter 12, and then we'll come back to Ephesians 4 real quickly. But Romans chapter 12, uh, we used this this morning, the first couple of verses there in uh, the devotion that... 
Ashley gave us before Sunday school. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. What mercies? Hey, Christ died for us. Amen. There's now, no, now therefore, no condemnation for us because of Christ and what he did for us. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Living, that's clear. That word sacrifice is holocaust, completely consumed. Okay? So being alive and yet consumed. Paul said it in Galatians 2 like this. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Holy consumed. Living sacrifice. Holy. That's set apart. Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now he's writing to the church at Rome. He's not writing to preachers so everybody in the church of Rome Christy had a reasonable service. Look in the next verse and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? Second Timothy chapter 3 um, about 14 to 16 says that the, the, the Bible makes us wise into salvation. It teaches us doctrine that's what's right. Reproof that's what's wrong. Correction how to make wrong things right and instruction in righteousness is how to keep the right things right that the man of God may be perfect seem like we talked about in Sunday school this morning somebody that did what was right but not with a perfect mind perfect truly furnished unto all good works okay that's how God works that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God but look down in verse number six now let's go verse let's go ahead and just read through it all right Verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think highly of himself, of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. So there's another way God says everybody can be saved. Verse number 4, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many members are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts, here's where we get to your end of individual service having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us whether prophecy that's preaching let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry that's serving let us wait on our ministering or teaching on teaching uh, he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation he that giveth let him do it with simplicity in other words don't make a big show out of your giving he that ruleth with diligence he that showeth mercy uh, with cheerfulness, cheerfulness. In other words, don't say, well, I, ought, I, I really ought to press charges on him, but I'm being merciful. No, be cheerful about it. Hey, man, I love you. God loves you, so I'm going to let you off. Let us love without dissimulation. In other words, don't fake it and abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. But God gives everybody a job, exhorting. What does it mean to exhort? Boy, y'all sure are quiet this morning. To exhort is to lift up, to encourage. Miss Karen, there's a guy, I forget where he was originally from, but he was old as dirt when I met him. His name was Dr. Earl Holloway, and he was the choir director at Crown College. And uh, to tell you how old he is, he, he was a World War II vet, okay? And I didn't meet him until 1999. So World War II vet. His first college teaching position was at Kentucky when Bear Bryant was there. So he was an acquaintance and, and really kept up with Bear Bryant through the years and had lots of cool stories. But Earl Holloway's chief gift was exhortation. He was encouraging because, you know, like if, if somebody like Randy says to me when I'm walking up, there comes a big one right there. I might be offended, you know what I'm saying? But Earl would say that same thing, Michael, when he'd see me coming. Boy, there comes a big one right there. But there was just something about the way he said it that just made you stand a little taller, stick your chest out. I mean, he just had the gift. When you get ready to sing, he'd say, He'd say, boy, I know I'm fishing to be blessed. I see Brother John coming up here. I mean, he just had that gift of exhortation. What's your gift? You've gotten a gift. If you're saved, God's given you something special to do that nobody else can do but you. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. 
And uh, we're going to read just about five, six verses of scriptures there. He says, I'm going to give you a time to get there because I want you to notice that we believe in a historical, grammatical interpretation of Scripture. In other words, we don't try to take it out of its historical context and we try to pay attention to the grammar because we believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration of Scripture. In other words, God chose every... When He breathed it, He breathed every word, okay? So if we look in verse 11, it says He gave some... Notice there's a comma. He didn't give some apostles. He gave some... Apostles. Apostles were somebody who spent three years with Christ. We don't have apostles today. We might call a missionary an apostle because of the idea of a sent one, but no missionary walks three years bodily with Christ like they did. He gave some, comma, apostles. He gave some prophets. Now, before the word of God was uh, come in its fullness, if you will, then people said things that were not found in writing but when the scripture was complete we don't have that need anymore we could prove that from first corinthians 13 but i don't have time to go there he gave some evangelists now I, i've got some friends that are evangelists and they go around preaching these revivals if you study what that word means really an evangelist is a church planter okay nothing wrong with what we have today as evangelists but the fact is he gave church planters and he gave some pastors and teachers but why did he give these differing gifts verse 12 for the perfecting of the saints didn't we read in sunday school this morning that amaziah did that which was right but not with a perfect heart that, don't we read in second chronicles 16 9 that the eyes of the lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to prove himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is what perfect toward him i think god wants us to be that, that word perfect means complete he wants to complete the saints to make us completely towards god for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying that's like exhortation it's building up the edifying of the body of christ until when until we all come into the unity of faith. I think you'll find over and over in the New Testament that God wants the church to be of one mind, one heartbeat, one, one unified spirit. Because if we all have the mind of Christ, which he says there in Philippians 2, he also says it in, in um, I think it's 1 Peter, it might be 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, he talks about arming yourselves with the mind of Christ. If we have the mind of Christ and we'll be unified, and uh, so till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a, there's that word again, perfect man, or in other words, complete man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We won't reach that, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, until we reach heaven be by death or rapture. But we're supposed to be working towards that, that henceforth we be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and by cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth, I'm glad it doesn't stop right there. It has that prepositionary phrase, prepositional phrase there, Channing, and tells us how. That's a, we call that a prepositionary phrase that gives the job of an adverb. It tells us how to speak the truth. You can speak the truth and make the whole world mad. Or you can speak the truth in love. And some are still going to get mad. But if you've spoken the truth in love, you have to let that fall where it may. But the, the, the key ingredient, Chris, is that we speak the truth in love. And may all grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body is fitly joined together. Look, there needs to be a transformation. There needs to be a sanctification of being set apart. But everybody has got a job. You know, everybody can't be the head. Everybody can't be, that's Christ, right? Everybody can't be the hands. Everybody can't be the, the foot. Maybe we're some small portion of the foot. Maybe we're some part of the ear I know when I hear I, I, I probably call names way too much but I know that when I talk to Charles or when I li let me say it this way when I listen to Charles talk I see a totally different perspective on whatever it is we're talking about at the prayer meeting the other night I spoke my heart about something we want to pray about and then when Charles spoke Boy, it was something else. Okay, so Charles is not the pastor, is he? 
I asked him if he were a deacon. He said, well, we don't have deacons at Bethlehem. So he's not even, not even a deacon, and yet he's being used of the Lord in how he speaks. And I know the Lord can use every one of us and may be using y'all in ways that I don't know about, so don't think I'm trying to build him up. I'm trying to build us all up that God's got something for every one of us to do. We all have a commission. And how do we bring that to part? How do we do that? How, I mean, how can I preach? I, I'm just a redneck from way back. How can I preach? How can I prepare sermons? How can, how can you do whatever it is God wants you to do? Verse 2. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. What is grace? In your own words, what is grace? Don't everybody speak at once, y'all overwhelm me. That's the words of Webster, I think. That's a good definition. <clears throat> Unmerited favor, unearned favor. That's right. In other words, we give that definition unmerited, and, and I don't, I wouldn't embarrass Bo, CJ, or Jake. But unless they've had that explained, I don't know that the average person understands merit. I didn't really understand merit even after I saw somebody get a meritorious promotion. In other words, they hadn't served their six months in grade to get that next, but they did something great, and the Marine Corps gave them a meritorious promotion. To merit something is to, we use the word we used it in college when I went to Bible college. You could get demerits, which I got a lot uh, when I lived in a, in a dorm. Thankfully, the second go around, I didn't live in the dorm. But uh, my my room duty, Randy, <coughs> was the trash, and I had two trashy roommates that, after I left for a 7:30 class, would put trash in the can, and if there's trash in the can at eight o'clock on Monday morning, you got demerits so i would get demerits they did it on purpose okay put something in there see demerits you take away something that somebody's earned a merit is when you add something that somebody's on a meritorious promotion somebody there were meritorious promotions there were many more meritorious promotions during wartime and you may see somebody that's a sergeant and they look at him and go well now you are a first lieutenant we need you this is your new We'll get the paperwork later, but you've been meritoriously promoted to an officer. That's a big deal. It's a big jump. But in our salvation, it is unmerited in that we don't earn it. It is a free gift. We didn't do anything to get the gift. We didn't do anything to deserve the gift. God gives it to us based on what Christ did. But grace doesn't stop with salvation. Grace does not stop with salvation. Grace carries over to our service. I can't possibly. I stood up here a couple of weeks ago and wept a little bit, explaining to you the fearfulness in preaching the Word of God because you're worried for how many reasons? You're worried that somebody sits under your preaching chops and maybe they don't truly understand. Are you worried that you say something uh, when you're preaching and and and? People get offended and go away and, and never accept Christ. It's a fearful thing to preach the Word of God. And the only way I can preach the Word of God is by His grace, which is what we've been preaching on prayer on Sunday nights. And this really, it, it's a salutation, it's a greeting, but in, in a sense, it's a prayer. Paul's paying, praying for them to have the, the grace of God. How, how can we raise children in the world that we live in today? There are so many things. I mean, my parents, Randy, thought that I had uh, more varied uh, temptations and, and, and things to, to try to pitfalls to avoid as a teenager. If that were true for me, it was certainly true for the kids that are being coming up today. You know, I can't imagine what all the, the youngest of the young uh, are going to face when they get to high school, when I see what high schoolers and junior hires are facing today. They need to, as a parent, we need the grace of God to help them navigate those pitfalls. As a, as a mother, you need the grace of God. As a father, you need the grace of God. As, a, as an insurance person, you need the grace of God. As a dirt worker, you need the grace of God. If you're bailing hay, you need the grace of God. How many people you know that have been bailing hay that had some tragic event? happen and they're 
they're gone. And who's raising their kids? You know, they, we need the grace of God. And just because something tragic happens doesn't mean that that person didn't have the grace of God. Now, I don't mean to say that. I'm just saying uh, Paul's praying here, and we all need the grace of God to take one step forward. Whether your gift is just to encourage people, whether your gift is prayer, whether your gift is whatever your gift is, whatever your calling is that God gave you to do, you need God's grace. Not only do we need God's grace, but we need God's peace. Look <clears throat> with me at Luke 14. I'll meet you there in a second. But we can have peace. I can have peace to preach the gospel, even though there's the pitfall of possibly offending someone. There is the, the pitfall of maybe not explaining salvation clear enough and, and stand before Christ and realize, oh man, I didn't say it right that day, and they didn't truly understand. And that's why there are tears to be wiped away. And we can be so scared. Den Denise has a, a high school friend. Uh, well... She's not in high school now, but when they were in high school, they were friends. They're still friends today, uh, many years later. And there was a time in her life, Miss Karen, when she was afraid to go to the store. She was so overcome, got saved as a girl, but she was so overcome with fear at one point in life that she was afraid to get in. Well, what if I get in a car wreck? What if, you know, take my kids to, what if they get some disease when we're at McDonald's and, and you know, what if they get the road, what, what, if you can be overcome with fear. But what did Christ say? Christ said in John 20, I give you peace. He said, I'm coming that you might have peace. He wants us to have peace. We can have peace in the midst of peril. We can have peace in the midst of a problematic world, I mean, we could talk about the election. We can talk about the economy. How many different ways can we talk about the world that we live in and find reasons to be fearful? Chris, I think there are fear mongers out there. A, a monger being an old English word, somebody who say, used to call a fish salesman a fish monger, okay? Fear mongers. You say, I'm not going to name names. But a national person has been saying for three or four years that milk is going to be $25 a gallon by July, whatever. He's the, he keeps moving the date, but he keeps saying that milk's going to be $25 a gallon and that, you know, you're not even going to be able to dream of buying a candy bar and all these. Have you ever watched the, do, do y'all have email? Anybody besides me have email? And you get these emails that go, the economy's going to crash within six months. Listen to this to see what to do. You know what the end of that is, typically? Give me some money and I'll show you how to beat it. That's why I say they're fear mongers. But, if we're saved, then there should be a transformation. Our lives should be you know, should have and should be continually taking part in sanctification. We should have this commission. And finally, we should have this, this supplication uh, or consecration in our lives, okay? Everybody has a job to do. Everybody, we're, we're commanded. The Great Commission is not a suggestion to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed, right? So every one of us are commanded to give the Great Commission, to tell every person of every people in every place with the passion, the love, the power, the authority of Jesus Christ about his death, burial, and resurrection. All of us are commanded to, to do good works, that they might see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. In other words, uh, our lives should be changed and everybody around us should see it. What is our part? Our part is speaking when he tells us to speak. Our part is praying when he tells us to pray. Our part is doing the good, carrying out the good deed that he tells us to carry out rather than hitting our spiritual snooze. Rather than hitting our spiritual snooze. Most of my life I've been 
a reasonably early riser, though there, I've always met somebody who gets up before I do. But most of my life, I've been a reasonably early early riser. But there was a time in my life, Charles, when I would stay out half the night. And, and I just, I could not even hear the alarm when it went off. I remember my dad coming in. I was living at his house at that point, And he'd come in. And when he wakes me, I can hear it. And I got it said as loud as it could go. And it one of those annoying, meek, 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 meek. I mean, it's as loud as it can possibly go. All right? And he's like, son, this got to stop. Turns it off, tells me to get up. But we do that spiritually. And we sound a lot like these people in Luke 14. And I know I've run long today. I promise I'm coming in for a landing. In Luke 14, verse 15, it says, And when one of them sat at meat with him and heard these things, he said unto him, he's talking to Jesus, Blessed be he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said Jesus to them, to him, okay, A certain man made a great supper. This is what we would call an allegory. He's telling a story to prove a point about salvation. A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things were now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, Let's make this easier. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it, and I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them, and I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servants, To go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto thee that none of those men which were bidden shall have my supper. I'm not saying that if you're, that if you're not carrying out what God called you to do, that you're not saved. And I don't want you to think that I'm saying that. I never tell anybody that they are saved or that they're not saved. But what I am saying is a lot of times in our Christmas Christian life, we are like those lost men that's a that's a that's a metaphor or an allegory of lost people and their excuses for coming to christ but i'm telling you we as christians use those same excuses well i've got to do this so i can't witness i've got to do that so i can't come to church i've got to do that so i can't read my bible i've got to do the other and we hit our spiritual snooze we hit our spiritual snooze today we all need exactly what the Apostle Paul had. He had salvation, and he was transformed by it. He was an apostle. He was set apart to do something. If you're saved this morning, you are set apart. He was sent out, okay? He had a commission, something he was supposed to do. If you're saved this morning, God's got something for you to do. Saved, set apart, serving, and supplicating. We need to be praying that we would be consecrated.